please welcome the man I consider to be the uh, best campaign manager in the world, here for our edification, Mr. Joe Trippi. Keep him warm with the jacket on, but I'll, I'll bail out of it. And just, um, let me pretend to get. Just put the slideshow on. That's good. So if you can go to the first one, yeah, just leave it there. Until yeah, it's just down. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, thanks uh, for inviting me up here, Jim. To, to speak again. I had a great time in Ottawa uh, several months ago. But I, I want to, I think the way to start this is to talk to you about the big sea change that's happening, not in politics, but in um, in sort of communications and a, and, and a power shift that's happening um, in, across everything. It's going to happen in politics and government, uh, in, corporate, um, uh, in, in the corporate world. And that is that when, what's happening here is, first of all, erase the idea that we're in the information age. We're not in the information age. Um, and I'll explain why. If we're, the reason I tell you you're in the information age is because all this technology, the internet, cell phones, everything, more information is coming to everybody um, than, they, than ever happened before in the world. Well, the problem with that is information is power. Information and the knowledge that people get from it is power, particularly in a top-down world. Parties are top down, governments top down, corporations are top down, and the way people get power in that world is by using the information they have to go up the corporate chain. It's why, by the way, the FBI doesn't um, share its information about possible Al Qaeda cells in the United States with the CIA, and the CIA doesn't doesn't share information with the FBI about possible al Qaeda cells. Why? Because if they're the ones, the agency that's sharing that information with the president, then they're the ones with the power. And they're the most they're the the biggest, baddest intelligence gathering service in the US. So they don't share anything. They information is power, they hold it. Well if we're in a world in which information is power and the internet is distributing information to more to people democratically globally in ways and speed and more information than anybody's ever had access to before, then the internet is not distributing information, it's distributing power. And the problem in the top-down world for the guys at the top is it's distributing power to the bottom that hasn't had a whole lot of that going on before. And the first um, um, sign of that, by the way, is was Napster. It wasn't the Dean campaign. It's Napster. Napster was a bunch of people at the bottom saying we do not like what the top-down recording industry is doing. Top-down recording execs are saying you're going to have to buy this entire album to get the one song that does not suck on the album, <laughs> right? And, and and everybody said like, I mean, we all went along with it for a hell of a long time, but finally because of the internet and the ability of people to connect and, and, and add their power together, that connection and the information they connect with each other, we're able to say, a whole bunch of people are able to say, no, we're not going to buy the whole album anymore. We want, we're not doing it that way. We'll, we'll break the law. We'll distribute it for free if we have to. We're not playing by your rules anymore. And, um, and so the top-down recording industry is sort of sitting there going, no, 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 we're in charge here. And the... Um, uh, uh, you know, what, like it or not, music is being distributed totally differently than it's ever been distributed before. You can now buy one song for 99 cents or vice versa. So Napster may or may not make it, but that's not the point. The point is the recording industry is distributing music in a way it never intended to, never wanted to, and absolutely was pulled in kicking and screaming, uh, but were forced to do it. Now, this slide shows a little out of date because it's from back when I gave in a, 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 the conversation in Ottawa. But I want to, there's an insight that I had in between all this, and that is a, a book came out by actually a very conservative blogger, uh, Glenn Reynolds, uh, instant pundit, wrote a book called The Army of Davids. 
came out about four or five months ago. And his whole thinking on this was the army of David's, that the net, he bought into sort of my notion about power being moved around. And what he really thought that meant was that this, these armies of David's were being armed at, were out there. And now Goliath's corporations, governments, etc. cetera, we have, have to figure out because David slew Goliath with the slingshot. And that was triggered in my mind that then, that then what political parties and what corporate, what we all have to figure out is how are we the slingshot for the people? Not how are we, because there's plenty of parties trying to figure out how they're going to be Goliath. I mean, my, you know, I mean the, the major parties in the state, the Republicans were Goliath. Um, the, the governments, Goliath. Corporations, Goliath. Now, let's go back to Napster, right? Napster, the recording industry was Goliath. Apple decided they were going to make slingshots. Right? iPods, iTunes. Goliath loses 20% of their profits. The guys that decide, let's make sure that army of Davids has slingshots, they're doing really well. Really, really well. Better than they've, they've done in a long, long time. So I think in terms of thinking about as a party, as a, as a, a grassroots decentralized party, um, you know, I think two things. How do we empower? We're, we're, in the, we're not in the age of information. We're in the age of empowerment. We're in the very, very early stages of the age of empowerment, where the bottom is being empowered and can join together and do unbelievably amazing things. At the same time, how do we, how are we a party that is giving people the tools, it, while they're being empowered, giving the tools to act on that power and make the change that we, that we think needs to happen? Um, and that's, this, that's thinking about the party as the party that's given slingshots to the people to get accomplished what we need to get accomplished, not the part, not another, not trying to become another big Goliath party. It's a party that empowers people and gives them the tools they need to, to, to accomplish what we need to accomplish. And what's really cool about this, and, and it's something Jim was talking about when he was talking about uh, the campaign that's going on right now, um, how few people can make it. I mean, it's probably not that many people that are sending in $4,000 a day. I mean, in, in terms of sheer numbers, it's a couple hundred, three or four hundred people a day or something. Jim, have, you have any idea? Total campaign and about 700 people have donated $100,000. Right, that's what I'm saying. So, so very few people. So that, um, you know, one person giving 25 bucks is a cheap, you know, has 25 bucks is a cheap day. 400,000 people doing $25 is 10 million bucks. And there's only one medium in the world that lets that happen, that lets 400,000 Canadians decide they're going to give 25 bucks to the Green Party tomorrow morning. If they decided to do it, there's only one medium. That can't happen on TV. And it's not going to happen on radio. It's not going to happen because there's a front page, because uh, there's a, a page uh, in the uh, a full page ad in the newspaper. You say, oh, we want, we need coffee machines. The next day you have too many. Um, and this isn't a very small campaign yet. So if, if, if you start the process of, of growing, it's amazing how a very small, and, and look at that again, you know, in, in, in a sense, I know 400,000 is a lot of people, but if four, I mean, it's not that many people. I mean, what I mean by that many people could really make uh, you're talking about 1.9 million votes. So 400,000 people doing 25,000. There are, I, I got to talk a little bit in U.S. terms. I, 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 there are a whole bunch of people, and they're here in Canada, they're every, that would, that would gladly give $25 to a party that was talking seriously about global warming. They would. They just don't know where the hell to do it. I mean, they don't, there's no, they, it hasn't really been, I mean, they know the Greens are there, that's not my point, but they, it's not easy. They don't know where to go here, I click here, and there goes $25, and I, and I, and I actually think they're going to be able to do something, with it, which is the other, other piece of that. But it's building that mechanism. Um, so, 
the, the, the important thing here, because uh, whenever we start talking about money and the net, the one thing that everybody learned in the States, uh, all my the guys on the other campaigns that were laughing at us, uh, the one thing they've learned is, hey, it's a great ATM machine, isn't it? I mean, you just, it, all they know about the net is, in watching the Dean campaign, was you can raise a lot of money. But they, don't, they didn't get the, no, you can actually build an amazing community. Um, and so the thing is to think about, it's about building community. Build a community and use the tools of the internet and, and technology to build, to, to give people a community of common purpose and common cause. The money, the volunteers, all those other things will happen. They'll come. It's like the blog that Jim started. He actually was creating a spot where people, the community, as small or big as it gets, could congregate, could come, read stuff, share ideas together, comment back and forth, and then you can say, hey, we need coffee pots and, or coffee machines, and guess what happens? We need to fund this campaign and $4,000 a day starts showing up. If you do it to do, your sole purpose is to get $4,000 a day, it will not work. People will see that from miles away, and they won't come anymore. And the only thing Jim ever talks about on his damn blog is he wants $4,000 tomorrow. And not only like that, if I tell my best friend to go visit his blog, he's just getting mad at me because the only thing I'm sending him to do is listen to a big, big promotion every day about money. So that's not going to work. It's about building a real community and uh, empowering people. If you build it for the money, you'll fail. And that gets to the other part of this. Um, the one thing that we learned in the Dean campaign that's really important as you think about building this is the, the community generally will only do one thing well. It'll do many things over time but not several things at the same time. In other words, if you say to the community, the most important thing you can do this week is find one more person um, to come to the blog or come to the Green Party site or think about joining the Green Party, get one person to do that this week. That's the most important thing you can do for us. Lots of people will do that. If you say to them, forget that one. If you say to them, the most important thing you can do this, this week for the Green Party, we have this election um, and we've raised $100,000 and we really think we could really increase things if we raised another 100000 The most important thing you could do this week is to set, send $25 and find 20 people to send $25 and get them to come here and contribute. People will do one or the other. If you ask them to do both, they will not do anything. They get over... Well, it's like telling somebody, well, the most important thing you can do this week is go find 100 people to join the Green Party. If we ask everybody in this room to find 100 people to join the Green Party tomorrow morning, you'd all leave and go like, they're crazy. Right? If it's one, look, when you leave here today, go out and find one person and bring them to the next meeting. Some, some people in this room will do that. Many people in this room will do that. But if you make it, and it's the same thing, it's, it's, and that's why it's really important to get this because when we were the four, going back to the Dean campaign, when there were 432 known supporters nationwide for Howard Dean, 432, our, our, his mom did not know he was running for president <laughs> at this point. And when she found out, she wasn't sure it was a good idea. But, but anyway, uh, 432. Well, if we had said, hey, send us money, they wouldn't have grown. So, I mean, we didn't know that yet. This is something we learned over time. But the reason we learned, the first thing we did was send out an email saying, look, the most important thing you can do this week there's 432 of us. You're the it. There's only 432 of us in the whole country, and you're one of them. The most important thing you can do this week is find one friend. Have them come to our blog. Ask them to think about signing up, read information about, you know, ask questions, but get them here and get them to sign up. At the end of the first week, we're at 1,200 people. 
We then said to the 1,200 people, sent out an email to them saying, it's unbelievable. In seven days, we went from 421 to 1,200. And, you know, that's ridiculously small. I mean, but there's 1,200 of us who really believe that this war is wrong and this needs to happen. And, you know, there's other, and our other issues and that uh, we need to bring Howard Dean to the attention of more people. The most important thing you can do this week is just get one more person to come here, all 1,200 of them. We do that. We grew from 400 to 1,200. Think of what could happen. Well, eight weeks later, I'm not going to go through the whole, uh, you know, this week it was this much. But eight weeks later, we were at 10,500. Um, by, that was like March. By June, um, we were at 159,000 people. We never, by the way, at this point, no one, you hadn't heard about us, still. We didn't ask for money on the internet until we were at 100-something thousand people. We, for the, from that first, it was just find one friend, find one person, tell them, tell them why you're for them, tell them why this is important to you, that they at least check us out, that they at least do, and they did. And if we'd been starting talking early on, oh, give us money, give us money, give us money, we would never have gotten 159,000 people. Forget about getting the 650,000. It just never would have happened. We would have scared everybody All Just another bunch of Pauls, all they want is our dough. So I'm trying to, you know, give you some of the reasons things, things happen and how it worked. Um, we, but then let me, And that's where we're getting here when you get down to these lower bullets. Building the community takes time, and almost everybody fails in politics because they won't take the time. Um, John, all these guys, particularly the big guys, the major, all they want is the dough. That's it. And so what the, this thing is, they, they sit there and they kick it a little bit, and the money just doesn't start running in right away. First off, because they're not saying anything. which is the other thing you do. you got to say something to get people to join. But, um, <laughs> I mean, you know. But anyway, so what, what happens is they, and they can't get it going, and after a while they, they give up. I mean, they give up because they don't want to put the time into building the community, building uh, uh, issues and stuff. So this is a, I've got to go through a little bit of what, Jim talked about, but yeah, we started with 432 online supporters. We grew to 650,000 in 10 months. We raised, it turns out, it's $59 million, uh, which blew apart everybody. It's not just the quarterly numbers that Jim was talking about. Uh, the record at that point set by both Clinton and Gore was $45 million in the primary. We, we did $59 million. And the record on the quarter which had been Bill Clinton's 10.3 million, we raised 15.1 million in a three-month, 90-day period. And by the way, uh, as Jim pointed out, that was not, Clinton set that record not as the governor of Arkansas running for president. He set his record as the president of the United States running for re-election in 1996. And with all due respect to President Clinton, we didn't have a Lincoln bedroom to sell for $100,000 a pop. Um, and so our, we did it with average contributions of $77, um, which is, you know, an absolutely unbelievable thing. And to give you, before you, give you sort of the situation in the states, uh, the Democrats will often complain about George Bush and his 631 pioneers and rangers, the 631 millionaires and multimillionaires who, uh, if you raise 100000 for Bush, you're a pioneer. And if you raise a million dollars for them, you're a ranger. So that's the way it works. So, um, so, um, uh, but we, the Democrats complain bitterly about what is just, just millionaires bundle, funding, fund, uh, bundling money, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars. For them. Okay, fair. Democrats, if I ask people which party in the United States raises more money from people who only give $100 or less, I mean, the smallest donations on the planet, $100 or less. Which party raises more money from more people? $100 or less? Republicans. Which party raises more money from people who only give $1,000 or less? The Republicans. 
$10,000 or less, the Republicans. $100,000 or less, the Republicans. A million dollars or less, the Republicans. There's only one category. Before the Dean campaign, the only category the Democratic Party outraised the Republican Party was in contributions of a million dollars or more. That's how far afield the party of the people, of the working people, had, had strayed from average citizens. That the only category they built that beat the Republicans was millions of dollars, a million dollars or more, and complained that Bush had these millionaires raising money for him. Absolutely crazy. So we come along and we turn this upside down with a campaign that has 650,000 people, most of which had never been involved in the part in either party before. I mean, these were not entrenched Democrats inside the party system at all. And, um, and in the victories that happened in 2006 were in large part due to this 650,000 people. I mean, they, they didn't, after Dean lost, they didn't, disper they stayed very active and they went out and raised, uh, uh, in one, just their own website, uh, actblue.com, which is a website that they set up, I mean, the citizens set up, can raise ten, over $10 million for targeted Democrats by just putting their names up and saying, hey, everybody, these are the people, this is our campaign this week that we really need. It wasn't the structure of the party, but this was the decentralized remnants of the Dean campaign that, that did that. Um, and this is um, the big thing that this kind of campaign turns, and this is really important, I'm going to spend a lot of time here, uh, with two or three stories, some of which are humorous at my expense, but, but, but uh, I think they're instructive about what this means. When you run a campaign like this, and when you start a part, when you work on building your party around this kind of decentralized uh, communication and really listening to your supporters, absolutely amazing things happen. Um, and um, I'm going to talk two or th tell you two or three things that happened about sort of listening to your supporters. We thought we were the most brilliant campaign on the planet because we had 50 signs, right? You know, Iowa for Dean, New Hampshire for Dean, California for Dean, New York for Dean. And we were going to be the first campaign in history to put those posters up on the website, on the blog. So all you had to do is, you didn't have to come to headquarters to get them. You just download them to your computer and print them on your printer, or just take a floppy or, a, or your key drive and take it to Kinko's or some other, and actually print out the big banner, whatever you want. You, I mean, any size you want, full color, the whole thing, and do it. Now, we thought, man, this is great. We announced this. We put it up on the block. And about three minutes after we announced it, and we're all patting ourselves, this is great. The first comment on the blog was, Joe Trippy, you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, you're running a presidential campaign, President of the United States. Puerto Rico votes for the Dem decides in the Democrat there's a Democrat primary down here and we decide who goes, you know. You you don't have a Puerto Rico for Dean son. How are you running a campaign for President of the United States and you're, you're so out of it, you don't even, you even forgot one of the places that does. I'm like, oh shoot. Scream out my door to my webmaster, Nico. Nico, make a Puerto Rico cut and paste. I will do anything here, but get a Puerto Rico for Dean sign up there. Three minutes later, it's up. Eight thank yous for Puerto Rico. Eight. Thank you. Really want to do that. That's great. Thanks for listening to us. Thanks for hearing, you know. Um, and the ninth one was, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> There's six million Democrats abroad. I'm in London. It was a guy from London, the UK. There's six million Democrats who live abroad. We all can vote for Democrat, for president, nominee, and you don't have a, a, a Democrats abroad or Americans abroad for Dean sign that I can download. And how could you just... Forget about us. Six million of us. <laughs> Geez, you're right. I'm, I feel like an idiot. <laughs> um, 
Global fixed that right away. And Nico did the sign up, and he does. And um, the next, the really amazing thing was the thank you came from a woman in Spain. <coughs> Thanks, I'm American abroad. Uh, this is great. I get to participate in my democracy from here, and I'm going to vote. And thanks for letting me download my sign. Now, there's the the I don't tell this story to say, geez, isn't it great? About like, look, in a normal campaign, anybody at a major party or a major campaign who's doing it the old-fashioned way wouldn't know that they didn't put a Puerto Rico sign up because people in Puerto Rico wouldn't have a clue that there were signs. I mean, in London and Spain, forget about it. It's not going to happen, right? This all happened in eight minutes. I mean, in eight minutes, everything I just told you, literally in real time, happened in eight minutes. Spain, London, Puerto Rico, all these places swarming in saying, you just screwed up. And we're saying, geez, you're right. How did we screw that up? Now, no, that's not what's important. That's pretty damn important, but that wasn't what was most important. What was really important was the thousands and thousands of people who are reading that blog every day were watching and looking and participating in something and realized immediately we were actually listening to them. That they actually were part of the party. They were part of this campaign. They actually owned it too. It wasn't just Joe Trippy and six we know it alls and sixty more of us in party headquarters and we're smarter than all no. They knew we knew that they, 650,000 heads were a lot smarter than the 60 heads at, at, at headquarters. And not only that, we were listening to them. And we were saying, geez, you're right, you, we screwed up. Thank you for helping us fix it. Now, the, the biggest um, example of this was, and I think it's even more powerful a, 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 an example, was uh, I came up as I often do, uh, or am accused of doing, of coming up with a really insane, crazy idea. And that was um, that we were just going to, we were just going to, uh, just going to show up in some cities and after telling people through email that we were coming, then whatever the hell happened, happened. In other words, we weren't going to go build crowds, we weren't going to send advanced people out, we were just going to, now, I can give you how does this happen. The way it first happened was we were going to send an email to Austin, Texas. At the time, we had 483 people in Austin that were for us. So we sent an email to him saying, hey, he's coming in two Thursdays from now. Just wanted to let you know. I wanted to invite you to a little cookout in the park because we are supporters in Austin. Two weeks later, we showed up. That's the only thing we did. We showed up two weeks later, and 3,200 people were in the park. And we only sent out 481 emails. So the first thing is, shoot, they must have emailed their friends or something. No, it's not because we're curious people. We want to find out what the hell happened. What happened was one of the 481 who got the original message sent an email out to everybody saying, hey, he's coming in two weeks. Why don't we have a little meeting at my place and talk about what we can do to get more people there. To, to This all happened without a, we had no clue this was happening. And what happened was, uh, first thing that happened was 100 people came to his house out of the 480. <laughs> um, and he couldn't hold it in his house because he had to take it in the backyard. And so they decide that they're going to leaflet the entire Latino community of Austin, Texas. The 100 of them. They're just going to latch the entire Latino side. And then there was 50, there was a city council race going on at the time on the next Tuesday. And there were 50 precincts in that district, and they were going to have two of each of them stand outside on election day and hand out leaflets saying to people who are voting, saying, Howard Dean's coming on Thursday to the park. So basically, that's what they do, and 3,200 people showed up. And the interesting thing about it was we had clipboards going through the park. Just sign up here and give us your email. Um, your name, address, email, and phone number. And um, so the reason we know there were 3,200 people in the park is 3,200 people which there had to be more than that because not everybody did it. The amazing thing was half of them didn't own computers. Um, you know, they, they would, you know, Jose Rodriguez, I don't have, you know, uh, here's my phone number, I don't have a, I don't have an email, I don't have a computer. So we'd have 
about over half of them did not have a computer. So this were all the internet decentralized on its own without the campaign having any clue other than just saying, hey, we're coming two Thursdays from now and 3,200 people, and they were getting people that did not have machines. So I, saw, I looked at that and said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Over four days, we're going to go to 10 cities, and we're just going to tell the 10 cities today that we're coming in three or four weeks, give them the dates, give them the places. You know, if, we, if there's 831 people in Seattle, we'll email the 831, tell them, Town Square, be there, Howard Dean, rally, you know, and whatever happens, happens. And, and while we're doing it, we're going to call it the Sleepless Summer Tour. And, <laughs> and while we're doing it, over those four days, we will raise $1 million over the Internet. And um, we announced it, and all the other campaigns said this was the craziest, nuttiest, most whacked out thing we've ever seen or heard. And, um, and we had no idea what to expect. We landed in Seattle, Washington, and 15,000 people were in Town Square. If you, if you guys don't remember, the, I mean, it was the most, it was one of the most amazing things that's ever happened in, in politics in a long time uh, in the States. Uh, Portland, Oregon, there are 5,000. Uh, Bryant Park, New York, 18,000. I mean, unbelievable. Now, the bad part was it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out we weren't going to make the million dollar mark. We were three days and 23 hours into it and we were about $890,000 being raised. I mean, it's still a lot of money. I mean, quite a bit. But we weren't going to make a million with an hour left to go. And our last stop being Bryant Park, New York. Uh, the press was really mad at us because we hadn't said them yet that day. <laughs> One less feed the press. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just one lesson that I can pass on to you. There. Uh, anyway, uh, so we literally we had not fed them yet, and they were starving, and they give them food. Uh, they get really ornery, so they were really angry. And uh, anyway, and they were you know gearing up to write the Dean fails to do the million dollar thing. So anyway, we decided to stop them at a New York deli about an hour before this rally. At the final one, where if we don't make a million dollars, they're going to write their thing that we failed. And um, as I'm pulling into the, the bus, press bus pulls up, they load off in the deli. I'm in there ordering a sandwich, and my cell phone rings, and it's my webmaster. And he says, Joe, this really weird idea came up on, the net, on our blog just now from a guy in Tucson, Arizona. And he says that he gave on the first day of the Sleepless Summer Tour $25. He gave on the second day $50. He gave $25 this morning. He's worried sick we're not going to make it. He's really tapped out. He's just a college student. But he's, he'll reach down deep and give $25 more towards trying to get us to a million if Howard Dean, when he walks on stage in Bryant Park, carries out a red baseball bat and just holds it up for C-SPAN, CNN, Fox, and Reese, and just says, you did it. And I'm sitting there saying, so he just, I, he, and he goes, not only that, other people are saying, yeah, that's a great idea. I'll give more, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I'm saying, that, I'm saying to, to, to Nico, you know, you know, Nick, I'm pretty desperate. He goes, yeah, Joe, I know. So am I. <laughs> okay, tell him, tell him that, that, that he'll carry a red bat up on stage. And do that. If you don't know, in the campaign on our website, Every time somebody gave money, the, the bat, it was a regular baseball bat, and it turned redder and filled up the bat as it went up. So they were, if we hit a million, it would be a full bit. <laughs> Our supporters would know what, the, the, what we were talking about, but no one else out there necessarily. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, we said yes. Uh, tell him, and he did. And, um, and he calls me back for like three or four minutes later. He goes, you won't believe it. Like, it it's, a, it's like launched some kind of like frenzy is just, so I get to the Bryant Park and I'm looking at, we had a huge Jumbotron screen that we had rented for the occasion, you know, of our web, our web page is sitting up there behind the stage and it's, it's like spinning, the odometer is spinning, 918,000, 
And I'm just sitting here going like, oh my God. <laughs> so he, so what happens is, is at exactly 10 o'clock, just as he's getting ready to go on stage, the thing just splits through a million dollars. It's one million three thousand dollars. It did like an amazing amount of money in like 45 minutes. And the guy on cue says, you know, ladies and gentlemen, next president of the United States, Howard Dean. And Howard is starting to walk on the stage. And I'm like, I had sent a kid out to go find a red bat, you know, like anywhere. It, just find a bat, paint it, whatever, but get gear fast with it, just like 40 minutes ago, and he's nowhere to be found. I mean, I didn't know if we were going to see him again. Howard's running, about to go up on stage, he's getting, bounding up the stairs, and all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see this kid running down the street <laughs> with everything he's got with a red bat in his hands. And just as Howard hits the stage, he tosses up, Howard catches it, walks out there, and goes, You did it! Now, now, my point is, thousands and thousands and thousands, people who weren't even part of our campaign, but who, it, the tension, the can they make it thing, that, that they were going to our own, Terry's people were going to our website to see the counter thing, just... Gosh, are they, it's a little, little engine that could going to make it. You know? <laughs> and, 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 and they all knew, they all knew that this idea had come like 40 minutes beforehand, 3,000 miles away in Arizona. And here at the candidate in New York, not a staff guy, but the candidate for president himself was actually had listened and said he did it. Now, I don't think at that moment anybody watching C-SPAN or CNN who wasn't part of the 650,000 people had a clue what happened. Because the next thing that happened, which was the most amazing thing, he says you did it with the red bat, and the 18,000 people in Bryant Park, New York, spontaneously break out singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game. <laughs> That's what happened. That's what the whole country had to be sitting there going like, what? <laughs> I haven't seen anything in politics. This is not politics. This is something else. Now, this is, by the way, this is what launches us. This is where we start to actually take the lead in the polls and stuff after this event. So it wasn't like they went, oh, that's weird. They thought it was not, po it wasn't po politics. The way, you know, just saying whatever is totally different. So, um, anyway, so what I was trying to do here is, is sort of get you into the, uh, notion that empowering this whole idea of the slingshot of empowering people of making them, that them knowing that they have ownership of the party with you is really important and that they're smarter than all of us um, now the one thing I want to do about smarter than all of us and I'll get to the email rules in a second things, but um, is uh, the one thing is uh, we had a problem Problem being, okay, so we're running this whole campaign this way. I mean, out in the open, transparent, like Jim said, sort of telling people what we needed, what we wanted, what we listen to their ideas, etc. And well, that means that, well, shoot, why can't Carl Rove just hire 100 people to come over and say horrible things about Howard Dean on our block, right? Or ask bad questions, or just drive us nuts and. And we were terrified that this was going to happen. This, ha this screen has nothing to do with what I'm about to talk to you about, so ignore that for a minute. But anyway, um, so we were spending all kinds of time at headquarters saying, how are we going to, it's going to happen, how are we going to fight it? And it happened. And what happened was somebody um, had spent an inordinate amount of time creating a Word document clearly that said Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean sucks, for like a hundred million pages. And then they basically came into our blog and so the, hey, I heard Dean's going to be in San Francisco tomorrow at nine o'clock. Where at? Question mark. Next post. Dean sucks, 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 Dean sucks. On the wharf. You know, you know, you know, Fisherman's Wharf. Well, I mean, you had to, like, really have a lot of patience to scroll through two zillion Dean Sucks. To, and, and so we were like, oh, man, it just happened. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And um, 
the community figured it out. Uh, the community themselves created a website, a different website, with a thermometer, a troll, what they call a troll thermometer, or a troll bat, that's what they call it. And they said, you do that one more time, the next time you do it, click this link, because next time you do it, all of us are going to contribute to Howard Dean. And when you click this link, you'll find out how much you've contributed to <laughs> so, so, right. so I'm sitting there going, brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> so the guy does, Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean sucks, Dean sucks for the second time. When you click the link, you find out that you just, that uh, several hundred people have just contributed, in that instance, $10,000 to Howard Dean. And if you do it again, Here's the link. Come back and see what you're what you're doing. <laughs> well, the guy the next day comes back and does it. I couldn't believe what happened. I clicked the link. One hundred fifty thousand dollars came in sitting there, and I'm thinking, who's going to know? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, but I swear I I was just sitting there going like. Come on, guy, just one more time, you know, <laughs> just one more time. Um, but my point in the story is that the, it gets back to the, if you empower people, if you give them this feeling, if they'll help you solve the problems. It, it, it's an amazing thing that happens. And when they're, then they're much more likely to go tell ten more of their friends, you've got to become part of this. You, this is different. We really are all working together. We really are going to change the world. We're going to change Canada, we're going to make it a better, and we're really doing it together. And once you get that going, that energy alone, forget about some of the issues. In other words, people start looking past, you know, my flaws, Howard's flaws, I mean, just different issues, because this was about all of us doing something together. It wasn't really about, it was always about getting him elected, I don't mean that, but it became something even bigger than that, because they were all part of it. And if you can, and, and I per, really believe the Green Party is in exactly the right place at the right time with the right, with this new era of empowerment to, to, to leverage all this and give people, and, and to grow much faster than would normally be the case, given the issues of the day, the ability to connect like never before, this empowerment thing, and, and, the, and the other thing is you're not, a, you really are a bottom-up party. I mean, that's the, the problem is the entrenched parties have been top down. For, they may have been bottom up at one time. I mean, the Democratic Party was a great bottom up party at one time. And, they, and my great, great hope um, is that me and other people can bring it back to that, that place. But you don't have that baggage. You are a bottom up party. So to, to put that, and you now have the, t you couldn't have done this 10 years ago. Right? I mean, we just, the tools weren't there. The biggest thing I say about the McCain, the, the most important election internet campaign history was the 2000 McCain campaign. I mean, in the United States, prior to being, was McCain. It was amazing. I remember being glued. I was like, forget about whether you like these politics or not. What they were doing on the net was amazing. And I was mesmerized by it. I was watching everything they did. 40,000 people signed up. Two or three million dollars got raised. Three years later, 650,000 people sign up for Dean. We're talking 2000, 2003 here. 650,000 people for Dean, 59 million dollars. That's not because McCain people were dumb. That's how much the internet changed between 2000 and 2003. That, there weren't any blogs in 2000. I mean, uh, meetup.com that we used to get 190,000 people across the country meeting up in offline every week, I mean once a month, excuse me, didn't exist in 2000. These tools, the tools that we had in the Dean campaign, we had no, we didn't have YouTube. The team, the, the tools that you have now, so what I'm trying to say is the, the net is becoming more and more powerful as a way for all, for us to communicate and, and connect with each other. As powerful as it was for McCain in 2000, it became that much more powerful for Dean in 2003. It's that much more powerful today for the Green Party and anybody who starts to build it now um, is one I think I finally articulated. Not sure, but um, so 
the one thing I want to talk about is like uh, is is on email stuff, uh, and this is a little bit in the nitty gritty. And I, I, I was I'll probably save most of this for Q and A because I don't know how many people are specifically interested in this kind of stuff. But uh, and I've got other things I want to talk about. Uh, how much before we take a break? Do you think? I think 15 minutes. Okay. So I'm going to blitz through this, and I'll get to some other. I'm going to probably go off this, and, and we can do some of it, cover some of it in Q and A. But um, the the thing is, the other parties, the, the like Bush went out and bought 8 million email names. That's what they did. Um, they, I mean, they, they didn't, they, they bought people that they believed were Republicans. I mean, they didn't just go, go try to, but what I, the point I'm trying to make is, if you start at 432, and it's because your best friend said, you should take a look at this, and you'll take a look at it, and you go, hmm, that's interesting, I think I'll join. That's a lot more powerful way to do this than, you know, we bought, you, you, you know, we bought the Sierra Clubs list or whatever, you know, whatever the, because those people may or may not feel any, there, there's no real connection, personal connection. And the, what, what's really important in this, in this era that we're in is peers. Peer credibility is, matters much more than any institution or head of the party or anything else. I mean, if, the best way I can explain this to you is, um, it, you know, if 10 of your best friends tell you, that they went and saw this movie last night and it sucked. You know, I don't, we'll pick one. You know, uh, you know, whatever movie's out right now. It shows you how many movies I get to go to. Not very many. But anyway, there's some movie out right now and it really sucks. But anyway, um, um, they can run ten, they can run millions and millions of dollars on television with really cool looking ads telling you it's the greatest movie ever made and you got to see it. It's going to win every Oscar this year. If your ten, if ten friends have emailed you saying this, I saw it. Don't waste your money. It sucks. You ain't going. So the money and the, the usual ways to tell people what to do versus peer telling you what to do is totally different now because of this medium. And that's why Greens have such. You have a lot more power than you think if you can get peers to start telling their friends, hey. Take a look at this. I think these people are making a lot of sense. I, I'm thinking of going to that meetup next week, or I'm, or, or I really want to listen to their candidate next, you know, at, at this thing. I mean, you want to come with me? But it's, it, you can get people from a peer level to do that, and um, so you want to grow the list organically, is what I'm saying. The more organic it is, the more power you're actually building over the long haul. The more inorganic, and uh, we got that list from someplace. It's not as powerful. Um, Actually, this has become obsolete. Um, collect email addresses and postal code. Code. Collect email addresses and postal code. Also, start getting people's mobile text numbers. Um, most we will want in about two years' time. Maybe the only way to reach anybody will be by texting them, and we'll be huh? text messaging on on your mobile phone. Um, it will be. It's much more prevalent in Europe and in Asia than it is in North America. It will be becoming increasingly more prevalent. And just like organizations today who've got great address and phone number, landline numbers, information, but can't doesn't has no idea how to email its membership because it never collected 